it. <laughs> and then also, um, we have speaking Laura Toledo coming from the University of Oregon, who is the department chair there, um, whose work is situated, I think, at the intersection of activism and scholarly work focused on geography and critical ethnic studies. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I don't, I mean, that's, I mean, that's my question. So uh, you can let me know if uh, we're on the line. And other than that, I'm going to turn it over to Laura. And we have this scheduled in the class, so we should have ample time for questions following your presentation. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And as some of you may know, I was supposed to come last spring and I had to cancel last minute because of a family emergency and I'm very uh, apologize, very sorry. So I'm very happy I'm to come back. And uh, I wish I had more time to hang out with y'all. Um, so I'm going to begin um, on a very personal note here. I keep getting that icky woman thing showing up. I don't know. Okay. Um, I will never forget the night that Donald Trump was elected President of the United States. I felt a combination of disbelief, pain, and outrage. I cried. I couldn't sleep for nights. For the first few months, I recall wakening in the morning to the awful realization that yes, he really was the President. It was not just a bad dream. I had to travel my grief somewhere. But can she make it go? <laughs> Ah, there you go. Um, right after the election, we connected with friends and comrades in Southern California, where I lived at the time. And as parents, we focused on things that involved children that were family friendly. Um, of course, we attended the Women's March in Los Angeles, joined millions in protest, which was really quite a remarkable event. While important, that was certainly not enough, though. I started a blog on my personal website, <coughs> which allowed me to begin I keep getting the uh, Edgy Rose thing. I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, I started a blog on my personal website to process the election and what this might mean for racial and environmental politics in the United States. Once Trump was sworn into office, things started happening, and they started happening fast. One of the ways I tried coping was to make lists. I learned this from my son. When he was about four, he began making lists, like, let's make a list of plants. Let's make a list of my favorite foods. And over the years, we learned that he was trying to impose order on a chaotic world. And I was doing the exact same thing. I tried following all the environmental stuff that was happening, but it was very hard. I managed to follow it through April, but then I gave up. I was preparing to move to Oregon, start a new job, move the whole family. And I couldn't maintain my list, but I was still paying close attention. During the summer of 2017, which was still during Trump's first year, his racial politics took a turn. Before that time, it was all about the Muslim ban and Mexicans. But then he dismissed the Black Lives Matter activists who were protesting police violence. In August, when the white supremacists rallied in Charlottesville, Virginia, he insisted that, quote, there were good people on both sides. It occurred to me at that point that I should probably start also documenting the racist things that he was doing. How were they similar? How were they different to the environmental things? And that is what ultimately led to this research project. <clears throat> In winter 2018, I taught a geography class at the University of Oregon called Race, Nature, and Power. Because I had not had the time to focus on my lists, <clears throat> I structured the class around a collective research project. And the task was to make comprehensive lists of all the racist and anti-environmentalist things that happened in Trump's first year in office, and then begin to analyze those lists and how they intersected. And today, what I'm going to do is share those findings with you. And I have to say that I had no idea what I was going to find when I started doing this work. <clears throat> as I explained, I initially did this as a coping strategy. But then I realized I was also doing it to keep a record. Like when you know something important is happening and you want to document, kind of lie as to what's going on. But when we saw the final lists and began analyzing, I also became very intrigued with what we actually found. <clears throat> Our findings give a whole new meaning to the term environmental racism, which is typically associated with uh, the spatial relationship between poor people, working class, 
and people of color in terms of environmental hazards. And while these special part patterns are certainly very important, I have long argued for an enhanced conception of what constitutes racism. So one that takes into account the various structures and uh, relations that create or produce the devaluation of certain groups of people in the first place, um, which includes certainly those spatial um, kinds of relationships. For me, environmental racism really is a window into a whole set of different kinds of uh, processes uh, related to racial capitalism. But our data indicated uh, a dimension that I had not previously considered. The degree to which racism impacts spheres seemingly unrelated to race. In this case, case wholesale environmental deregulation. We found, building on the recent work by Josh Inwood, that white supremacy impeded progressive reconfigurations of the state. Indeed, this should come as no surprise, as almost 20 years ago, Ruthie Gilmore observed that crisis is resolved through, quote, already existing social, political, and economic relations. And I think it's safe to say that, the US, that in the US, racism is an existing social relation. There are, of course, many different kinds of racism that we can talk about. We argue that Trump has deployed what we call spectacular racism to hail the white nation. By doing so, Trump has engendered a powerful anti-environmental agenda. Now, in no way is his environmental deregulatory agenda confined to environmental justice issues. It is entirely across the board and attempts to roll back decades of environmental legislation and policy. While it is true that Trump denied global warming during his campaign, he now says it is real, but uh, not human made. Although you might have heard last week, he also tweeted, like, because it was really uh, cold in the, north, in the northeastern United States, what about that global warming, right? Kind of calling it into question once again. But he really didn't campaign very much on environmental issues at all during his campaign. What he really did campaign on is make America great again, right? A not so subtle call to return to a period when white men ruled the world. And people uh, like me, meaning female and brown, knew our place. The flip side of MAGA, of course, was the racism he directed towards non-white and immigrants. He campaigned as a populist, using spectacular racism to mobilize the white nation. He won by promising things he could never deliver, such as restoring economic prosperity to the working class or building a wall that Mexico would pay for. Needless to say, we didn't get those things. But we did get a massive environmental rollback. The vast majority of people who voted for him were not necessarily demanding any kind of environmental rollback. Of course, that has long been a desire of the Republican uh, 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 Party and its leaders. But some really interesting things happened here. I think Arlene Hartschild, in her study of the Tea Party voters in Louisiana, she really focuses on why it is that working class people living amidst tremendous uh, pollution could in fact advocate for uh, environmental rollbacks when it's framed in terms of anti-state politics and an anti-elitist agenda, when they feel that those very policies are not serving them themselves, but in fact are serving corporations which are kind of getting away with murder, which in fact they are, right, when it comes to environmental issues. So what we have what we have here is a very interesting relationship between racism and the environment. In this case, racism shapes the political environment, which has led to changes in the physical and natural environment through deregulation. So first, what I would like to do is discuss this idea of spectacular racism. Second, I'll present an overview of our methodology, and then third, talk about our findings. So let me talk a bit about spectacular racism. Our concept of spectacular racism draws from Rob Nixon's work on slow violence, which he contrasts with spectacular violence. We define spectacular racism as racism that is characterized by immediate sensational visibility. As I'm sure many of you are, are aware, uh, Trump began his presidential campaign in 2015 by calling Mexicans rapists among other things. Quote, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. 
They're not sending you. They're sending people who have a lot of problems, and they're bringing those problems with them. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're racists. And some, I assume, are good people. This is an example of spectacular racism. One of the reasons that Trump's racism is sensational is because it is, or perhaps was, transgressive. His statements violated US norms of acceptable racial discourse, which of course was precisely the point. His transgressive racist, racist speech, we argue, accomplished four specific uh, political objectives. These include affirming the white nation, dehumanizing targeted groups, distracting from crisis, and obscuring policy and legal changes. And I'll talk about these briefly in turn, starting with affirming the white nation. If we define a nation as an imagined political community drawing on Benedict Anderson, the white nation is a political community partly constituted by whiteness. It is not defined merely by the exclusion of people of color, immigrants and not Christians, but rather by the valorization of whiteness, which is really, really important. <clears throat> um, in, the, in the US, the white nation constitutes what Fobani, writing in the Canadian context, calls exalted subjects. The white nation sees itself as the rightful owner of the US. It is their nation which others are infringing upon, including Muslims, Mexicans, and even indigenous people. The white nation is deeply racial, of course. It exists in opposition to blackness. Thus, one of the primary functions of Trump's spectacular racism is to affirm the white nation. Throughout the campaign and throughout his presidency, he continues to bolster the white nation. Whether he is bashing the National Football League players who are protesting police violence, moving the US Embassy to Jerusalem, or calling the mayor of San Juan, Puerto Rico, quote, totally incompetent. Trump is feeding the base, the portion of which is the white nation. He reminds them that they are the true Americans, the true owners of the nation, and he is the only one willing to speak up for them. By his actions, speech, and body language, he asserts the power of white men. A second function of Trump's spectacular racism is to dehumanize targeted groups. By making outrageous, transgressive statements about Mexicans, Muslims, African Americans, and others, he paves the way for concrete policy changes. This was most apparent in terms of the Muslim ban, which he attempted to implement in January 2017, within one week of taking office. Uh, we can see this as well in his treatment of Mexican and Central American immigrants this past summer, when 6,000 Latino families were separated at the border. This action, which occurred outside the time periods of our data collection, outside the parameters, shows both the balance and the trajectory of spectacular racism. He starts with transgressive speech, then moves to concrete policy measures. Of course, such policies are also a form of spectacular racism. In no way is the Muslim ban effective policy. Likewise, separating thousands of children from their parents at the border has been a disaster. The separation policy has cost so much money that the Department of Homeland Security has had to use its natural disaster fund to cover the cost of incarcerating children. And thus, when Hurricane Michael came around this fall, there was not enough money to cover those costs and expenses. So such policies must be seen as spectacles themselves, which are actually is a very long history in the US of border policy being, uh, be being uh, spectacles, uh, going back to at least 20 years now. Uh, these policies speak directly to his face and show Trump as accomplishing things, however symbolic. A third purpose of his spectacular racism is to distract from political and economic crises. This happens in several ways including blaming racial others for the periodic crises of capitalism. The white nation does not demand structural analyses or solution for their economic immiseration because they are being fed false explanations which affirm their status. Thus, immigrants are blamed for the invisceration of the working class. In addition, few have the mental energy or capacity to engage uh, given uh, it is a state critique. This is because the entire nation is being fed a steady diet of spectacular news. 
which consumes the new cycle as well as individual energy. Consequently, there's far less energy and capacity to intervene in other issues. And this is especially significant early on in new regimes when excessive norms are being violated and spectacular racism is shocking us. A third form of distraction is the cultivation of an authoritarian regime centered on a particular individual. Trump is the focus of media attention and political debate, far more so than actual policy matters. Authoritarian's power comes from loyalty to the person, not to a set of ideas, values, or institutions. Taken together, all of these work to divide the working class, which of course is one of the oldest functions of white supremacy, and leads to the enhanced power of capital, which we saw in spectacular fashion last December when there was a massive tax cut passed in the United States favoring both corporations as well as the wealthy elite. The final function of spectacular racism that I'm going to mention, and the one most germane to this talk, is that it obscures concrete policy and legal changes. Because attention is focused on the transgressive statements and acts, far less attention is directed to the actual actions, including the restructuring of the state that ultimately serves capital. Trump has ushered in a neoliberal agenda scarcely imaginable a decade ago. Under his administration, laws and regulations that groups like Allied which is the American Legislative Exchange Council, um, which I'm happy to talk about, um, have advocated for decades. Through his administrative appointments, the regulated are now in charge of the regulations affecting the industries and their constituencies. For example, Betsy DeVos is the, now the Education Secretary. She has worked for decades to promote charter schools, vouchers, and other programs designed to undermine public education in the US. Rick Perry is a Secretary of Energy. Before assuming this position, he famously declared that the agency should be abolished. And most spectacular has been Scott Pruitt, the inaugural director of the Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA, under Trump, who famously sued the EPA 13 times before assuming the leadership of, of the organization. Of course, none of this is new. White supremacy is the US's go-to response during political and economic crisis. We saw this after the Civil War and Reconstruction. We saw this during the Great Depression, when there was both the incarceration of Japanese Americans and the expulsion of Mexicans, which of course is another recurring theme throughout US history. And we see this after the economic collapse of 2007, as well as the growing progress, or as a response to the growing progress that people of color, women, and queer people have made in the United States. As anyone has argued, because of the depth, power, of, uh, the depth of power of white supremacy in the US, it can be harnessed to achieve a wide array of objectives. Thus, it is hardly surprising that it would play a key role in environmental deregulation. Indeed, if one looks back to history, the opposite is also true. The U.S.'s environmental movement blossomed on the heels of the civil rights movement, where we're seeing an expansion of rights and democracy. We also saw a change in the environmental uh, uh, political culture. Spectacular racism is certainly not Trump's only way of attracting support or, and maintaining his base, but it has been a central part of his strategy. His calculated use of spectacular racism has channeled diffuse anger and anxiety into a ferocious wave of energy that is the white nation. Thus, the white nation is fundamental to Trump's power. Despite violating laws, norms, the truth, and maintaining a chaotic administration, his base remains loyal. And through the power of the base, he has reshaped the Republican Party in his image. The white nation is key to all of this. It is important to locate uh, spectacular racism within its larger historical context. Joni Malana, a literary scholar, has argued that the US state developed a series of anti-racisms after World War II. She notes that overt white supremacy ended at this time, and the US state adopted various anti-racist frameworks, including racial liberalism, liberal multiculturalism, and neoliberal multiculturalism. 
neoliberal multiculturalism, which we have been living in throughout the 21st century, can be characterized by a dematerialization, if you will, of race, and a severing from the violence of capitalism. It centers on various forms of inclusion and political correctness, without challenging the structural roots of racial injustice. This was the norm prior to Trump's ascent. The whole idea of political correctness, which was torn apart by Trump, um, <clears throat> completely changed the moment that we're in. It's critical to understand that the tr things that Trump says and does are not new to the US. They are only considered transgressive in this particular historical moment. Because the US has convinced itself that we have moved beyond such overt forms of racism. The impact of spectacular racism is not incidental to the larger British formation. Instead, it comes from within it and it is actively transforming it as we see today. Consequently, we're living with a combination of overt white supremacy and neoliberal multiculturalism and it is unclear where we are headed. So given this framework, we ask some very basic questions regarding Trump's first year in office. Specifically, we ask, what has been the relationship between spectacular racism and environmental deregulation during his first year? What has been the role of spectacular racism? Which populations have been targeted and why? <laughs> and how has environmental deregulation occurred? So I'm going to now talk a bit about our methodology, about how we set about trying to answer these questions. Our class, Race, Nature, and Power, had 25 students in it, and they were both graduate and undergraduate students. And the first thing we did was we divided the class up into groups according to topic. So we created a set of environmental groups and then a set of what we call the racial groups. Um, <clears throat> and each of the environmental groups was assigned a particular environmental topic such as you see here, such as water, land, air toxins, uh, climate change. And each of the racial groups was assigned a particular population, such as Asian Americans, African Americans, Black Nexus, uh, Muslims, Iran, China. This actually, this last exercise became very, very difficult and muddy, as you might imagine. And that's because Trump has exhibited racism towards so many different populations and groups. The U.S. domestic group was relatively easy to do, but the international relations were, are also very deeply racialized under the Trump administration. It is impossible not to see Korea, China, and Palestine, for example, as racialized countries. And you might remember this famous comment here. We were acutely aware that our categories were problematic, but we could not find a better way to proceed. Um, this whole exercise, on the one hand, it made me very sympathetic uh, to the everyday challenges that my colleagues who work in quantitative methods face on a regular basis. On the other, I also think it's a great example of the fictions that are forged when quantifying reality. It imposes false categories on very messy experiences. As if Muslims and African Americans are entirely discrete populations. Or as if dismantling water protections won't impact wildlife. Nonetheless, we set to work collecting as many events as we could find from January 20, 2017 to January 20, 2018. January 20, obviously, is the day of in his inauguration. We define an event as new federal policy, policy changes, policy delays, observed acts of censorship, executive orders, memoranda, federal appointments, including the lack thereof, federal budgets, federal court rulings, as well as Trump's speeches and tweets, uh, because in the United States the Department of Justice has viewed them as a, a presidential statements, as well as all federal legislation, um, including proposed bills. <coughs> Meaning they have not become law, but they're in the process. <coughs> Each team then made a spreadsheet of all the different uh, uh, events that they found, and they included such things as the day, the justification, impact, spatial dimensions, if it was contested, and things like that. For most topics, we did not have to start from scratch. There were already several databases tracking the Trump administration by the time I started, but they were all much more narrow in scope. 
such as Columbia Law School's Climate Change Track, and the American Civil Liberty Union's list of civil rights violations. We pulled from existing databases, and then we ventured out from there. Students follow the congressional record, Trump's Twitter accounts, major newspapers, federal agency websites, and the like to document what is happening. The data indicate that Trump's environmental and racial agendas were indeed unfolded in distinct fashions, which we believe are meaningful. Despite significant chaos, we view Trump as a strategist, and environmental deregulation as part of the larger neoliberal agenda embraced by the Republican Party. This is important because agendas that fully align with the Republican Party have been much more successful successfully implemented than those that did not fully align. And a quick note before launching into our findings. Our data captures a more fractious and diverse Republican Party. Many mainstream Republicans, you may or may not be aware of this, they were opposed to Trump. They were deeply opposed to Trump, the mainstream Republicans. Since taking office, however, Trump has literally reshaped the Republican Party in his image and likeness. No Republican office holder challenges him now without risking scorn and losing the next election. It was not like that in the first year. Oh, in that first year, over 44 Republican legislators left office, including dissenters such as Jeff Blake. So we show, show you here on the red the number of Republicans that have left office during Trump's first year, and then here we have the uh, number of Democrats that left. And we've seen a huge upset for both parties because Congress has become such a horrible place to be. Uh, you know, people talk about being very, very toxic environment. But we can clearly see the patterns and what was, and what was happening. Thus, the data that I'm about to present captures a more fractious Republican Party, one that embraced environmental rollbacks, but had some unease with Trump's racism. Given these dynamics, it is not surprising that spectacular racism has helped obscure <coughs> the relatively smooth and devastating environmental deregulatory way. This obscuring has occurred through both numbers and noise. And I'm going to talk about numbers first. So numbers refer to the frequency of events, whether speech, legislation, or a non-appointment. We found 195 environmental events and 354 racial events. This might lead one to conclude that more resources were invested in a racist agenda rather than an anti-environmental one. But it's not that simple. An important distinction emerges when we consider the kinds of events that we are talking about. Um, or that characterize both the racial and the environmental agendas. We distinguish between rhetoric and concrete actions. This pie chart here shows a distinct pattern between the two agendas. This indicates that concrete actions, of which there were 256, were far more likely to be environmentally related, 67% specifically, compared to the racial ones, which only, only of which 32% uh, or in that category. This divergence is even more pronounced over here in this uh, pie chart, which depicts all discursive events, all right? There were 293 discursive events. Here we see that 92% of discursive events were racially related, while only 7.5% were environmentally related. So clearly, he seems to have a distinct strategy for each agenda. Though we distinguish between rhetoric and actions, we are painfully aware of how the two inform each other. Consider Trump's proposed border wall. Clearly, the wall maintains the borders of the white nation, both metaphorically and literally. It nurtures Trump's base, thereby uh, securing continued support. Repeated reference to the border wall has also pushed the realm of political possibility to the right. Indeed, in the winter of 2018, the fate of DACA recipients, and those who have DACA refer to the children that were brought to the United States uh, uh, with parents that were unauthorized, right? 
And so there's been many attempts in the United States on what are we going to do with these kids? They didn't break any, you know, they were brought here against their own volition, right, as a two-year-old or whatever. And at this point in time, in um, last January, Trump basically held the a, a resolution of the DACA recipients hostage to his border wall until he was going to get funding for it, all right? Um, so this wall, of course, keeps coming up and again and again. If you were following just this past week now, there was pepper spray that was a spray on um, immigrants at the border, um, just, you know, Monday or Tuesday or something like that, right? Such tactics, both spectacular racism and using DACA recipients as bargaining chips, further erodes norms and humanity, which are essential to a functioning democracy. As such, Trump's relentless racist rhetoric actually serves to normalize a spectacularly racist policy agenda and obscure the vast array of environmental changes underway. Let's take a closer look at some of the environmental um, actions undertaken in this first year. Table two lists environmental actions by kind. Topping the list are policy, appointments, and executive actions. These three alone account for almost 70% of all environmental actions and illustrate a broad neoliberal environmental agenda. Policy actions include rollbacks from the Obama era, the Department of Interior streamlined its national environmental policy ad reviews, and they also are reconsidering fuel economy standards, all with an eye to make them more, uh, more, uh, uh, more in keeping with what industry would like. The easing of deregulatory requirements is, of course, fundamental to neoliberalism and something the Republican Party has long desired. We were also interested in the kinds of justifications uh, or how these, uh, how these decisions were narrated by the Trump administration. Um, the Trump administration was really quite frank in justifying its actions. This table lists the different explanations given by the responsible parties for the various actions. Significantly, there was no explanation for almost one third of all environmental actions. This silence registers as an absence of noise which we will explore in the next section. They're deliberately not calling attention to these actions. The next two categories, which totals over 40%, are business interest slash competitiveness and efficiency. While it is sometimes necessary to decipher coded language, this is not the case here. These justifications align precisely with the Republican parties and the president's stated priorities. Indeed, Trump passed an executive action early in his presidency prioritizing making business competitive and government more efficient. Efficiency justified 20% of all environmental actions. In Republican speak, efficiency refers to efforts to make the regulatory state leaner and more agile. They claim efficiency saves taxpayers money and makes regulation less burdensome for industry. But efficiency also embodies what Jane Peck calls the hollowing out of regulatory capacity. This was exemplified by 30 non-appointments in the environmental arenas. Michael Lewis, in his latest book, states that approximately one-third of the staff of key departments, including the Department of Energy, have left since Trump took office. This is a staggering loss of expertise, experience, and historical knowledge. <coughs> Appointments are also a form of deregulation that requires specific attention. Of course, non-appointments indicate, as I said, a hollowing out of regulatory capacity. But Trump has been a master of appointments. On the one hand, there are random, incompetent appointments for agencies that he really doesn't care about or wants to just see them wither. For example, Ben Carson, a surgeon, is the head of housing and urban development. His qualification? He grew up poor. On the other hand, there are highly knowledgeable people who have historically attacked the agencies they now oversee. For example, Nancy Beck was appointed as the EPA's toxic chemicals unit. Beck came from the American Chemistry Council, where she made tracking toxins more difficult. Or Scott Pruitt, 
in one of his many pro-ape industry moves, barred scientists who received EPA funds from serving on the agency's regulatory uh, boards. Uh, their science advisory boards that they have. <coughs> he, just, he justified his actions as treating industry fairly. Quote, <coughs> we have committee members that have received tens of millions of dollars in grants at the same time that they're advising the agency on rulemaking. That's not right. As a result, private consultants and industry members have gone from 8% in 2017 to 32% in 2018. These are textbook examples of what Danny Faber calls the polluter industrial complex. A third form of neoliberal governance is privatization and creating opportunities for industry. This was most pronounced in terms of fossil fuels. One of the first things Trump did when he became president was to issue a presidential memoranda supporting the Keystone XL and Dakota Access Pipelines, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This was followed by expanding offshore drilling and a review of national monuments in an effort to shrink them. The breadth, depth, and speed of environmental deregulation, unlike other parts of the Trump agenda, such as the Muslim ban, which was characterized by chaos and massive opposition, has been relatively smooth and carefully crafted. One reason for this is because environmental governance has been envisioned as a multi-stage process. Consider that in February 2017, Pruitt was appointing EPA director. On March 28th, Trump signed the presidential executive order on promoting energy independence and economic growth. On March 29th, one day later, the Department of Interior lifted the ban on coal mining. The administration explained, quote, given the critical importance of the federal coal leasing program to energy security, job creation, and proper conservation stewardship, this order direct directs efforts to enhance and improve the federal coal leasing program. So here, executive actions have been crucial to providing a circular justification. Executive action, an executive action is something the president has the authority to do. It's not an act of Congress, it's not the judiciary, it's just the, the president himself. So executive action drives agendas from agencies. The directors implement those changes, and they are then justified by the executive actions. This is very effective policy making, using the power of the executive to drive the entire agenda. Despite having to resign over ethics violations in July 2018, Pruitt was a skilled administrator. Having sued the EPA numerous times, he understood exactly how to deregulate. I would like to now turn to noise, all right? Now noise, we use this term to highlight the attention associated with specific events. And this is figure two, once again, which shows us all discursive events. The fact that environmental issues comprise less than 10% of all discursive events indicates that Trump was more likely to be silent on environmental issues and relatively noisy on racial ones. With some exceptions, such as the Paris Accord, pipelines, and national monuments, most environmental actions have been unfolding in silence. As one student observed, Trump is not tweeting about air. These silences are meaningful, especially in light of the number of environmental actions undertaken. And when Trump does make environmental noise, it is largely symbolic. It is finally happening for our great clean coal miners. Uh, this table, that shows uh, who Trump has been directing his rhetoric um, towards, or against, I should say. Number one leading the list uh, in frequency were Mexicans and other Latinx groups, with a total of 94 events. Recall that Trump initiated his campaign with transgressive remarks about Mexicans. Although his campaign predates our data parameters, its significance has resonated throughout his first year as it set the tone and strategy. Although many of Trump's comments focused on immigrants, it is impossible to conceive of Mexico and Mexican immigrants outside of the U.S. racial formation. As Don Michael Rivera has argued, Mexico has served as a racial national other to the U.S. white nation since the Mexican-American War in the 1840s. Ethnic Mexicans are ideal fodder for Trump's spectacular racism. 
because of the U.S.'s deep history of anti-Mexican racism. Pejorative meanings of Mexicans are well established and pervasive. They're criminals, dirty, lazy. One need not produce new meanings or new connections. One can simply draw on hege hegemonic anti-Mexican ideology and sentiment. Though Trump attacked Mexico and Mexican Americans, he reserved most of his bile for immigrants, a convenient target since most of them cannot vote. Mexican immigrants are complex racial subjects as they pose both a racial and national threat to the white nation, as seen through Trump's eyes. The threat of contamination was even evident in a tweet implying that Mexican trash was more hazardous to Border Patrol agents than U.S. trash. <laughs> Next in line are uh, uh, the broad category of Muslim South Asians Arabs with over 80 different events. As a transnational population, the rhetoric is directed at multiple peoples connected by region and religion. However, this population is partially targeted precisely because of its presence in and connection to the United States. For example, in February, Trump tweeted, um, everybody's arguing about whether, the, whether or not it is a ban. Call it what you want. It's about keeping bad people with bad intentions out of the country. So we really see that connection, right? People and regions related to Islam have been positioned as others to the West and America for centuries, but especially after September 11, 2001. Similar to anti-Mexican discourse, anti-Islam rhetoric has deep roots in the United States. But its spectacular nature, combined with specific acts, such as the Muslim ban, have profoundly reshaped the racial formation. Under Trump, the white nation is actively being produced in opposition to Mexicans and Muslims. <laughs> Significantly, there was black people and Native Americans received far less attention during this time period of consideration. We were initially surprised by the relatively low levels of anti-black racism exhibited, but we attribute this to two things. First, African Americans, despite their secondary status, are more accepted as part of the U.S. nation in that their racialization is not tied to an immigrant status for the most part. To be clear, African Americans are certainly not part of the white nation. But nationalism is a driving force behind Trump's racism. Many Americans recognize, however begrudgingly, that African Americans were wronged by slavery even if they refuse to acknowledge its afterlife that shapes contemporary black experience in life. African Americans' position as the ultimate racial other within the U.S. racial formation may also influence their treatment by Trump. Because they are seen as the leaders of the civil rights movement and have influenced how the U.S. frames race, African Americans often serve as an official litmus test, if you will, about what constitutes racism. Thus, well, it has been acceptable to vilify Mexicans and Muslims. It is more transgressive to do so against African Americans, uh, to do so as explicitly and flagrantly. Indeed, Trump himself has a long history of anti-black racism, but he decided to limit his anti-black rhetoric upon becoming president. Nonetheless, there were numerous law, law and order comments directed against groups like Black Lives Matter, and he went on Twitter wars with black athletes protesting police killings. And it is entirely possible that the way we see white supremacy operate, that the way he's treating Mexicans and Muslims could then pave the way for other kinds of more targeted attacks against black people. So it's not like they're off the hook. Um, they're just not peering into this particular data set in the same way. Um, Native Americans also were infrequently targeted by racist rhetoric. Uh, who, who also occupy a distinct position as colonized people. While black and indigenous people encountered less racist rhetoric from them, they have not been without harm. For indigenous people, we view environmental actions themselves as violence against colonized people, as it is their land that is being appropriated and degraded, with vast consequences for their health, culture, nation, and ability to survive. Though it can be argued that both Native and Black people are part of the nation, we must recall that the U.S. was 
support through slavery and colonization. Thus, their exclusion, domination, and eradication were central to the formation of the U.S. The fact that Mexicans, Latinxes, and Muslim Arabs are currently more targeted by Trump's racism reflects the complexity and fluidity of the U.S. racial formation. So to conclude, hopefully I have shown how Trump's environmental and racist agendas are unfolding in distinct ways. While potentially interesting in and of itself, I am drawn to the larger implications of this. First, I am interested in the larger conception of environmental racism. Clearly, racism has been a powerful tool in facilitating an environmental rollback. Racism is providing the fuel for the Trump agenda, not environmental deregulation. The implications for social movements should be obvious, and they need to radically rethink the boundaries and connections and frameworks that these different movements may be using. Of course, there has been a coming together of environmentalism and anti-race groups of, over the past three decades through the frame of environmental justice, uh, but clearly it is entirely inadequate to the task at hand. Second, this exercise provides more proof, if more is needed, of the power and ferocity of white supremacy and the white nation. It may be obvious to outsiders, but it is not to many people in the United States. The entire U.S. project is built on the denial of racial violence and white supremacy. Thus, it is difficult for many to see its many manifestations. We are deeply committed in the U.S. to a highly contracted conception of racism, which precludes an honest engagement with the past. Indeed, most Trump supporters would deny that he is racist, and certainly that they are even supporting a racist political project. And finally, there's the question of the evolving nature of the U.S. racial formation. Hate crimes are on the rise. Racial violence is appearing in all kinds of surprising places. Of course, there's many in the U.S. who are deeply opposed to Trump and what he represents. And we saw some of that in the midterm of the elections um, this past month. But there are also many who are emboldened to attack others who they see as a threat to the white nation. The U.S. has gone to war before over the struggle over white supremacy. The question is, will we be headed that way again? Only time will tell. Thank you. with politicians and the whole kind of, you know, we're, we're entering a new era, right? 
uh, at, at this point in time. And so there was a really clear decision on the part of many different media to not to show a lot less of the visual spectacle because they thought we're just feeding this, this isn't right, and we really want to move away from that kind of a spectacular news cycle. But at the same time, you know, we have a very split, this is a big thing in the United States, the split media markets and the split media audiences. And so if you're watching Fox News, Fox News, you're absolutely seeing this, right? All the time, relentlessly. So that part of the so his base which is, um, and those people watch Fox News too, I'm not saying that they're the only ones, but um, they're very much seeing those kinds of things, but other people in the United States are not seeing those in the same kind of way, mm -hmm. right, because of their choices by different kind of media outlets about how they're going to do that. Mm -hmm. And that would include both paper, um, as well as some of the news sites, and then TV news, um, and, um, and, 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 and different radio outlets. Mm -hmm. So yes, it absolutely is current, and you're right, I don't pay enough attention, um, to that, and I think it's really, really important. But it's also a very split thing mm -hmm. that's happening. Yeah. A related question about the spectacularity of what you track. I was wondering if your research tracks. I mean, it's telling that the statements that he makes, while like, horrible, are also really newsworthy, and events of environmental deregulation along the same parallel time don't get reported in the same way. And whether there's you've been able to draw any inferences or like thought about that as a research question, what gets reported, what doesn't, and the timing of certain statements. Um, we saw uh, so we did do an analysis with the timing, and I couldn't have any references to it. So there isn't. I, I couldn't, and I thought maybe I, I well not to say I had the most sophisticated chops in analyzing this, stuff, <laughs> um, but I have the data and. It would be good to have, uh, and one of the person looked at with me in, you know, April was like a really good month, and we could figure that out, aligning with other kinds of things that were happening, you know. So, yeah, I was not able to draw any it's possible, but it is not possible. It is entirely possible, <laughs> right? That's what so I did look for. That. Yeah, we did. I mean, that was one of the first things we did do that in the class, and then afterwards, I um, hired one of the students in the class to do a much more deeper analysis, and that included the temporal. Um, looking at that, and I just I couldn't find anything. Mm -hmm. Me, that knows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for that talk. It's, it's fantastic, and especially really inspiring the way that you were did it through your your teaching as well. Oh, so, yeah. that was fun. So <laughs> yeah, it does sound fun. Um, so I was wondering what this kind of this um, disjuncture between the racial discourse and the environmental discourse, like the fact that one seems to obscure or, I mean, obscure the other, like the environmental like policy changes, like do you have thoughts on what this would tell us about the, the kind of nature of Trump's base or the white nation? Or does it tell us something about, about that? I think the thing that I would want people to take away is that, um, uh, the centrality of white supremacy and how it operates. And so I'm just looking at environmental issues. We can actually do the same thing with whole other spheres, right? Housing and urban development, health, I mean, foreign relations, you name it. I mean, I think we could find those things. I'm just looking at one of them. And so I just think it shows the, um, the incredibly dangerous um, and powerful nature of white racism and how it can completely hijack and transform different kinds of any agenda, mm -hmm. right? And you lose all kinds of sense of transparency and relevant information because of this kind of both events and then the reporting of those events, right? Um, because they're seen as so transgressive and you know, newsworthy and stuff like that. I'm going to ask a follow-up, if that's okay, okay, because that's what we, <laughs> we do. Uh, <laughs> um, but, so, is there anything particular about the environmental deregulation that, like... Yeah, yeah. Like, now that you've just said, sort of, we could do this with anything, is there is there yeah. something? Okay. Yeah, so, um, the thing about the environment, and I don't have proof for this, uh, that would be a separate project, but I, I'm, like, 95% sure of this. <laughs> so, in the United States, there's different conservative organizations and think tanks, and they do lots of work to facilitate and promote their agendas. And so right now, we're going through a whole bunch of uh, judiciary appointments, and literally all of them have been vetted by the Federal Society. 
So they've just been waiting for decades. Let's get our men in office. Here's the list of people. Boom, 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 ready to go. And we're seeing a complete transformation of the judiciary. It's very, very well orchestrated. It's very well, uh, it's very smoothly operating. It's very powerful, right? And Trump has nothing to do with this. He's just the one who is like, okay, I'm an officer, although he's telling me to do. The same thing is happening with the environmental law. Okay, and so I mentioned this group called Alec, which is, is the American Legislative Exchange Council. And they have been around since at least the late 70s, early 80s. And what they have been doing is they've been trying to write, I mean, and they were very much, this was like so, um, uh, at, it really goes back to after World War II, where we get kind of like uh, you know the New Deal in the United States, and there's like worker rights, and then we get an expanded welfare state, and we move on to environmental regulations. As soon as that happens, industry gets together through the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and they say, okay, how are we going to respond to this? We have to you know go on the affront. and so they create different kinds of think tanks and organizations, and one of them is Alec, and what they do is they write legislation that you can start at your local city council, and then you can start at your state legislator, and then you can move up and up and up. And that's the idea, and they've been doing that for decades. And they have what they call like ideal legislation that they have been circulating and trying to get go throughout the 50 states, just ready to move up when the time is ready to the federal level, and that time is now. So and that's one of the reasons to me, absolutely, it's like it is so well orchestrated. And Scott Pruitt, we know, is involved in all of these things. Um, you know, he was one of the people actively working with Alec, and he was doing that in um, Oklahoma before he moved on to that current uh, current position. So yeah, it's the environment, and because it's been like a, a, a priority for industry. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for your talk. So my question is actually related to the design of the course itself, um, and especially uh, I have questions whether or not you are concerned with, you know, maybe uh, academic policing. Um, I recently read about a case of a professor who either got suspended or uh, reprimanded because she encouraged some of her students to uh, come and uh, not vote against that, but protest the appointment of uh, Justice Kavanaugh. And so my question is, you know, do you see challenges if? You have designed this course, and then half of your students were Trump supporters. Yeah. How would you be able to kind of still do the work that you do, or how would you be able to bring them in? Right. Right. Good question. So um, I kind of knew that half of them would not be Trump supporters, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I did have some Trump supporters, and um, because it was an empirically based research project, it just did not. It was not a problem. So we did have difficult conversations. Um, and but the bottom line, there was two things that was happening. One, so many of the other students would like kind of like push back against these students. So I actually didn't have to do, I didn't do a lot of that work. But they saw the data. Mm -hmm. They saw the data. I did not make that shit up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they went and they collected it, and they saw it. And they don't have to agree with their interpretation of it. Um, I invited, so we, during the class, all we did is we collected the data, and then we did like this preliminary analysis, this is a quarter system, I didn't have a lot of time. But I invited anybody from the class who wanted to continue working on it and to write a paper. And so they all had the opportunity, and some of them did, and the paper is going to come out in the annals in the, in the March, um, in the March issue, the special issue on authoritarian regimes and environmental governance. But they had the chance, and they all, you know, the data was just so powerful to them. And I actually had these really, um, I had two, two young men, both who came, who came from rural parts of Oregon, both family were big Trump supporters, and um, uh, I have no idea how they stumbled into this class, but they did. And it was really, it was really great. Um, it was because I saw, you know, they had this transformation. And as they were going through this process, and they were hearing the discussions, and then they were doing the, the data, collecting the data, you know, one of them, at one point, he actually believed that corporations existed to provide jobs for him and his community. And as he began to realize, oh, that's not their purpose, I mean, he was just like, he cried. And he says, I've been lied to all of this time. You know? I had another guy who had the same thing talking about the white nation. Oh. I get it now why my family feels this way about Mexicans and Indians and you know fill in the blank. You know, and it was these really painful moments. But it was that that's how we 
grow. That's how we shift. That's how, that's how consciousness changes, right? And so it was really a wonderful experience. And I'm very thankful that I had some Trump supporters in the classroom. I might have felt different if it was half the class. <laughs> that might have been a very different experience. Um, but I was very careful, very, very clear to stick to this is the, this is the exercise. It work, I tell you on the first day of school, you can sign up or you can leave, right? Let's work on it. Um, I'm just going to figure out how to phrase it, but uh, I'm curious who exactly Trump is wanting to hide his agenda from. I mean, promoting this huge racist agenda, but taking all these actions on the environment. Uh, could you mention that Arla Hasha's book, um, which I read in life, and she points out that, I mean, this is the Tea Party, not your average Republican, but they have lots of other beliefs that allow them to justify environmental regulation being fundamentalist Christians and therefore being more concerned about the afterlife than this planet um, and just supporting free trade so much in the free market that they think that free market will even regulate environmental issues given no interference. So if that is the stance of an average Republican, then they would seem to be okay with environmental regulation even if it was part of um, his open sort of discourse. So is it the case then that he wants to hide this from the left because he thinks that they will be more or less effective organizing around racial issues than they would be around environmental issues? You lost me, lost me on the last part. They'll be more effective organizing? Well, Trump is just seeming like a bit of a puppet master at this point. So I don't know if this is your the implication that you are drawing this one that I'm drawing, but it seems like he wants the left to organize around racial issues, which is why he's being so loud about Oh, them. okay, well, first of all, let me challenge your idea of the left, okay, in the United States. <laughs> there is a liberal, uh, and there is a growing left, there is, there is. Um, and if you look uh, recently, again, through the last election, I think something like a quarter of young people identify as socialists, which is pretty radical for the United States, okay? But the fact that's, that's very constrained <laughs> by age, right? Um, and so these I really don't think has a left um, that, we, that we can really speak of in, in a robust kind of way. But he is trying to hide from the mainstream, main, main middle America, because actually if you look at like most people in the United States, um, particularly outside of like the Tea Party movement, there's really broad support for environmental regulation. There has been for many years. National Park Service consistently ranks as the number one federal agency in popular support in the United States. So it's not like most people in the United States are like, yeah, they don't want that stuff better. Um, they see this makes my life better, this makes life better for my children, my community, and so on and so forth. So they get that. Who he's trying to block, uh, he, he's trying to block himself from the larger majority. Increasingly, the Republican Party has been on a demographic death wish for a while now, right? They are just running out of voters, okay? Demographics are not in their favor, and they have chosen, after um, Obama won his second term, you know, the Republican Party did what they call like a major auto, oh, an auto, an auto, 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 auto autopsy, and they decided we just have to broaden the base, we have to stop the racist rhetoric, we have to include all these other people because there's not gonna be enough white voters for us to go after. There's just not. So they know that, and so they have to, uh, so they know the majority of the country is not on their side. And so that's why they want to obscure it, because it will be massive, more opposition on the part of environmental groups, who really, they just can't even keep up the environmental groups, right? I mean, they're just like working nonstop, and you know, 75% of everything is just getting away anyway, right? So that's who they're trying to hide it from, more than anybody else. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I have a question about, I know there's no like, either or answer to this. I'm just curious what your, what your thoughts are on it. It seems that there's two ways of talking about Trump. You know, uh, one is that he's tapped into a long-standing white supremacy that has you know, animated the US and Canada, but for you know, forever, effectively. That since the nation that existed. And then there's another idea that he seems to be you know, producing a new intensity of racism yeah. and, and, uh, and, and, and sort of calling white people to their whiteness, mm -hmm. perhaps that they may or may not have recognized before. Mm -hmm. And I know those things can coexist, but, I'm, but because, uh, what I have in my head is the way that people talk about how 
he says what everyone else is thinking. You know, and I mean people say that he's just saying what lots of people are thinking. And I, what I'm wondering is if you think he's saying what a lot of people were always thinking, or if he is also at the same time, produ you know, literally calling white people to their whiteness in that sense, like producing a new racism. Or a yeah, 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 right. Uh, so uh, he's doing absolutely both. I did, I mean, early on in the campaign, when he first began, um, you know, uh, like he, he opened the campaign about Mexicans as racist, and that kind of like smashed political correctness at that point in time, right? And I'm personally one of those people that I used to like, I have been very critical of political correctness, you know, and very, uh, this is, you know, kind of, <laughs> I'm not necessarily <necessary. laughs> What I did appreciate was the extent to which political correctness actually acted as a firewall. And that helped uh, maintain the racial violence or put a lid on it because of political correctness. And I did not appreciate that. All right, once you take away that firewall, well then, boom, you can do whatever, right? And we're seeing what happened whatever. So it's, it's A, he was saying what people thought. I mean, white people and white men in particular were simmering and deeply resentful about political correctness for decades, right? They really, really were very resentful of that. So he absolutely was saying what people were thinking, or at least what a segment of the population was thinking when he when he said that thing about the Mexicans as, as rapists. So that happened. That smashes the firewall of political correctness. He at the same time then is hailing the white nation, calling people into right into being as whites to, to protect themselves and, and their nation. But then at the same time also he's giving permission to the overt and violent white supremacists. And we have lots of different kinds of interview data coming out about the extent to which um, white nationalist groups, white supremacist groups are like, oh, it's a whole new, it's a whole new landscape for us now with Trump. You know, we have to rethink our strategy because we have been given implicit approval and permission to do what we want to do. So I see these a whole series of different kinds of dynamics all headed in the same direction. But yeah, we can sort them out. And there's, I think, also increasing like a really interesting geography that I'm really interested in studying, you know, about those, um, the, the spatiality of those dynamics and where they're occurring. And I think the Pacific Northwest is particularly an interesting site, um, given it is historically as a white population and it has had, you know, different white nationalists have gone there. And then at the same time now, this is a good example of kind of the complexity of historical dynamics as, you know, what different white supremacist groups are targeting Portland, for example, because they know it's a liberal city and therefore they're going to get a backlash. They're going to create a scene. There's going to be you know, the, the race war that they want right, happening. So we can see like these sediment layers of like, you know, centuries of different kind of white supremacy, you know, no black people allowed in the state of Oregon, you know, whole pioneer kind of sediment. Uh, in terms of the settling and dispossession of Native people in Oregon, you know, building the society, then you get white nationalists there because we're going to build our little utopia here with no colored people, and then we get this latest layer of happening. So many, many uh, complicated things happen. Yeah, I've got a question, but it's not, it's not very clear in my mind. But uh, something was really what you call it, like surprise me every time um, I hear people discussing like Trump politics is that uh, it is usually discussed in this uh, as if it was exceptional, as if it was you know because it's America and because it's like yeah. like oh gosh this is happening in America but I think populism there is a long like history of populism being used like elsewhere and especially in the south you know we have like you know big you know you populists know. like yeah, oh, yeah. yeah no i mean leaders yeah and, and the strategies and these strategies that you were describing of course they are different in terms of the white nation or whatever but they are like related to other strategies that were also very much connected to race that were like using let's say argentina chile and Colombia, venezuela like and in different ways, but in ways that, according to me, are like related. I just wonder, and there is a huge like, literature coming from other places that actually analyze how they 
like work, you yeah. know? How, yeah, and, and I, I was thinking about like how in there are now scholars who are like finding out how policies that were used uh, in Europe or big, big changes that were like observing, like certain compiled, um, were first tried out in the colonies. I just were, I, I just wonder about like whether there, I mean, like critical scholars are actually thinking about how yeah. to get the, you know, that, um, how to, to yeah, how to build those connections, like in a way that is perhaps uh, productive to understand, like what is coming next. I mean, how how is how is this yeah. going to work? Yeah, yeah. No, within you know, right away after Trump was elected, I mean, there was like a pe people looked at the campaign, they began doing that, and you know, making the comparisons with Nazi Germany. And that is still going on. I mean, if we, we can just con see it continue to move because it has now moved way beyond rhetoric, right? We saw, you know, people are being, uh, you know, uh, hit with tear gas, and President Trump, or I don't know, or maybe it was the Secretary of Defense, who knows, you know, saying like, "Oh, it's just natural stuff. It's yeah. made from water and pepper. You can put on your nachos and eat it." I mean, you just like these ridiculous justifications. We had to do this, and this was the nicest thing that we could have done. I mean, it's thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it's just insane. It's just crazy, right? Mm -hmm. this, this, the, 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 the level. Of it. Yeah, and so lots of people in United States are absolutely tracking and making those parallels with more than anything with Nazi Germany. Yeah. Yeah. And, th and they're always careful to say, no, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. You know, but we're just like inching, right? Every, every day. We're inching further and further, and like you know, just like the last step with like the the people at the at the borders, like the most uh, I think prof the most profound examples of where we're going. I mean, actually, you know, physically, you know, attacking people in this way, right? We've had camps along the border, right, of six thousand people living in tents, right, and they're being detained and. People die in those conditions as well. I mean, at what point do we say, you know, we are involved in genocide? At what point do we say we're in a state of civil war, right? Without declaring, you know, like we did in the first civil war, I think it's gonna be more like the kind we have, like in Central America for a long time, uh, you know, low intensity conflicts, right, going on. Or the whole thing of the white, uh, the white, uh, many of the nationalists, you know, their strategy isn't necessarily we're all going to get together as an army, but more individual attacks, right? Dispersed cells operating, right? At what point do we come to terms with that? I don't know. And because our level of denial is so deep, it is so essential to the functioning of the U.S. nation that if you can't deal with the truth, I mean, you're not going to see these things or, you know, see them for what they are. You know, and that's like so fundamental to all of us is the level of denial, right? It keeps the whole thing going. <laughs> yes, it looks like it sounds like that. <laughs> to what degree the data is essential to help people see things for what they are? Oh, I don't believe data is going to help people see things for what they are. <laughs> oh, yeah, I gave up on that a long time ago. <laughs> I'm all about popular education. <laughs> You know, uh, my dad, he was a, uh, some of you might have heard the story, but we talk about people's guy. He was a union man all of his life, and a very proud union man, and um, as he retired, one of my uncles said, hey, you should start watching Fox News. And within a matter of like two or three years, he declared himself a Republican, right? And because Fox News is a super powerful way of communicating with the masses, right? It's a form of political education. It's a form, it's a side of political consciousness and transformation. And that's what we have to be about. At least I do. <laughs> I know a lot of people do a lot of other things too, but I think that's where the work has to happen. Absolutely. Your data is not gonna convince that many people, right? You didn't convince my two students in the class, right? Okay, that's good. But you know, we, we're talking about millions, right? Um, that need to happen. So I think what we need is like a multi-pronged strategy in the United States. And the one that we have to be thinking about literally, you know, seizing power at the top and just to present, pre prevent the loss of life and dehumanization that's happening. But at the same time also, we need to very much be about the work of shifting consciousness, right? And, and, and rehumanizing ourselves and having some kind of commitment towards some semblance of democracy, which is, you know, one, one could argue we've never had. But still, that could be a valuable goal to work towards. Rehumanizing. Rehumanizing, yeah. <laughs>
just wondering about the environmental uh, regulation that we've been looking at. And would you describe like Trump's approach as kind of you know a kind of typical neoliberal like deregulation and um, you know, kind of like opening up uh, uh, you know, like environments for uh, <coughs> markets, or is there something kind of unique going on in terms of like, the way the like, Trump administration is like understanding the environment? I don't know. I don't think so. Although um, I gave this talk recently in Sweden, and so Don Mitchell was like, "It's all about post neoliberalism. It's not neoliberalism." <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and uh, I don't know enough to say. Um, it, it, in many ways, I find that a compelling and important argument to think about where we are in terms of the history of capitalism. And there certainly are those who say, you know, we are. In the capitalism, what we call this era now, I don't know. I don't know enough to say. But I think generally his kind of approach and treatment, I, I just find it very much within keeping just like so much. I mean, I remember that I'm old enough to remember like when Ronald Reagan was president in the 19, in 1980, he got elected president. And I remember he said, if you've seen one tree, you've seen them all. And we were just like, oh, oh my god, I mean, oh, how can he say something like that? I mean, this is just like, this is a, this is a whole new level. I mean, this is like, yeah, project manager. I don't know, what do you think? Uh, yeah, that's something I've been thinking about, but I, I haven't looked at it closely enough to put my finger on it. Yeah, I, I don't know either. I think this is like, yeah, phase two. <laughs> if it was going to be phase two. Shortly. Um, so thank you so much for that. Thank you.